by Lester Crowley and Sex Magic. Have I caught your interest yet? Stay tuned to find out more on Lester Crowley, the tradition of Thelema and Sex Magic. Hello everyone, I'm Angela and welcome back to my channel. I'm a university lecturer and a researcher and this channel is your online resource for the academic study of magic, esotericism, paganism, shamanism and related currents. I'm extremely honored to have in this video an interview to Marco Passi, Associate Professor in History of Hermetic Philosophy and Related Currents at the University of Amsterdam. If you've been following me for some time, you will already know that I've been mentioning Marco Passi and other scholars in his department at the University of Amsterdam quite often. They are basically the heaven for <laughs> people who are interested in historicism, magic and these kind of topics. And Marco has studied, among other things, Aleister Crowley, the tradition of Thelema, which would be pronounced in Greek Thelema, and sex magic. Just help me in welcoming the amazing Marco Passi here on Angela's Symposium. Hello Marco, how are you today? I am good Angela, thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming here on Angela's Symposium. I'm really honored and really thrilled that you're here uh, with us to talk about Crowley, Crowley actually. <laughs> uh, the tradition of um, Thelema and sex magic. So the first question that I'd like to ask you, Marco, is uh, who was Aleister Crowley uh, and what role did he play in Western esotericism? But first, please clarify to us, is it Crowley or Crowley? That's a good question. And actually, many people are uncertain about the pronunciation of the name. In fact, it should be Crowley, because there is a poem uh, by Crowley where uh, the rhyme is with the word holy, uh, predictably, perhaps, knowing uh, Crowley's own psychology. So we know for certain that at least he uh, used the pronunciation Crowley. Then, of course, uh, the same name can be pronounced uh, in other ways. I mean, other people may use the same name, because obviously it's a name that other people also may have. Uh, in other ways, but we know that Alistair Crowley at least pronounced it that way. So that's, uh, that's that, and I think this also fits, by the way, with the Irish pronunciation. Crowley was not Irish, but he had uh, a passion for all things uh, Celtic. And therefore, I think if he had to choose between different pronunciations of the name, that probably he would go for that one. Yeah, when, when you talk with academics, it's inevitable to <laughs> to go <laughs> and dive deeper into pronunciations and the philology of terms. But yeah, thanks for clarifying that, because I've always been confused about whether it was Crowley, because in Britain they tend to say Crowley, and in the US and elsewhere they tend to say, to say Crowley. But the poem thing actually clarifies it quite nicely. So I should say something about uh, Crowley now, okay. Yes, now that we know how to pronounce his name. <laughs> yes. So uh, Crowley was uh, probably uh, the most important uh, occultist uh, of the 19th and 20th century. Uh, at least uh, the one who is uh, most visible, so to speak, today in popular culture. So uh, his name is known uh, to uh, young people and actually to different generations of young people, especially starting from the 1960s, uh, because he has been mentioned uh, in all sorts of uh, you know, popular uh, media, in, in songs, uh, in um, literature. Uh, so it's actually a name that uh, has gone beyond uh, the, the small world, the small or big world, depending on perceptions of esotericism, and has uh, filtered through also popular culture. He is very important uh, for a number of reasons. I would say that certainly his influence 
in uh, contemporary religiosity is um, is very important. It's very it's very visible. So it's not just about popular culture, but also the fact that many new religious movements, uh, uh, neo paganism, uh, uh, contemporary occultism, ritual magic, uh, uh, Satanism, also contemporary Satanism have been influenced uh, significantly by by Crowley's ideas. So. In order to understand uh, what happens today in these kind of uh, contexts, you have to know something about uh, Alistair Crowley. Now, uh, Crowley uh, is an author that is situated historically between the last quarter of the 19th century, he was born in 1875, and the first half of the 20th century. So he, was, he, uh, he died in 1947. And I think the, the, the interesting thing about Crowley is that um, he was certainly a well-educated person. So he was actually an intellectual. Uh, he was extremely well-read. And this is something that uh, makes perhaps for an interesting difference with respect to other uh, modern esotericists, occultists, um, some of whom were actually sort of self-taught. Uh, if you take uh, the example of Eliphas Levy, for instance, a French occultist, um, so earlier than Alistair Crowley. Uh, in fact, Crowley believed that he was the reincarnation of, uh, of uh, Eliphas Levy. Uh, or to take another, another case, uh, El, um, Elena Blavatsky, for instance, uh, the founder of the Theosophical Society. So uh, we are dealing with authors who certainly had... Um, you know, um, they, they, they had read an immense amount of literature, uh, so they knew a lot of things, but at the same time, they didn't receive a formal education like Crowley had in one of uh, the most prestigious universities in Great Britain, uh, that, is, uh, that is Cambridge. So there is something there that, um, yeah, makes for um, kind of intellectual complexity that is extremely interesting. And uh, it's a bit ironic, in fact, that Crowley very often is dismissed as a kind of a quack, so someone who, you know, a bit of a charlatan, someone who really is not relevant, is not interesting, uh, so who does not deserve to be studied seriously. Whereas, in fact, uh, he was uh, someone who, well, had really interesting things to say, a really complex uh, thought based on an immense variety of, uh, of sources. You know, um, one of the interesting things about Crowley, uh, it's not unique with Crowley, but again, we have, uh, you know, a very significant case there, is his ability to bring together um, a broad variety of traditions. So uh, clearly he constructs his own system uh, based on uh, ideas uh, that, um, you know, are picked up a little bit everywhere in the history of uh, Western esotericism, on the one hand, but also Oriental traditions. So he brings together things coming from uh, the ancient magical papyri, uh, things from um, early modern uh, or Renaissance magic, such as uh, uh, John Dee's uh, Enochian system of magic, uh, uh, the tarot, uh, astrology, alchemy, uh, and of course also sexual magic, maybe we are going to come back to this, uh, but then also ideas that are coming from the East, uh, so he's very interested in yoga, he's interested in, in, in Tao, uh, he's interested in uh, the I Ching, so basically he brings all these different ingredients together and creates something that is actually completely new, completely original. So it's this uh, eclectic uh, ability, I think, that makes also uh, for the fascination that he had on uh, several generations of, um, of followers, of practitioners. So people who basically discovered uh, his ideas, his thought, and then uh, started to, to, to follow them. 
But more generally, uh, this explains also why he had an impact also on a significant number of intellectuals, of artists, also in his own time. Uh, one thing that uh, maybe is not appreciated enough today is the fact that uh, Crowley, during his life, had a very, very broad network of friends, of acquaintances, um, who were coming from the most disparate uh, quarters, but very often were very important personalities uh, in literature, in the arts, uh, in philosophy, in, in sciences. So that's something, something that shows that if Crowley could uh, hang out with this kind of people, so people who obviously were uh, usually quite intelligent, quite smart, it's because uh, he had a certain kind of intellectual uh, charm himself. So it was not just a certain kind of charisma that could be used, uh, I don't know, with people who were a bit weak, perhaps a bit uh, fragile. Uh, that's the typical stereotype that we have of Crowley, who you know, had a certain kind of influence. Uh, there you have a certain image, perhaps, of... Uh, uh, particularly fragile women who would be, you know, uh, under his spell, so to speak. No, but in fact, he could actually interact uh, at the same level also with very interesting, very important people. Um, I have studied, for instance, uh, his uh, connection with uh, the Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa. Yeah, my favorite poet, and I also have the book. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, this is just one example, one example of uh, the, the many interesting people that uh, Crowley hung out with. Yeah. So would you say that the um, reason why he said such a big impact on Western hystericism and different magic practicing traditions is because he was able to collate all these different elements from different traditions, which is also something that we find in other um, traditions which practice magic. Even in um, New Age, even in the New Age movement, we have this kind of uh, tendency to include elements from a variety of traditions and not sticking to one, to kind of individually tailor the practice upon the personal inclination. Um, so would you say that that is the, um, uh, the element that made um, Aleister Crowley's um, work particularly significant and his tradition particularly impactful on Western hysteritism? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you uh, place uh, Crowley back into the context uh, to which he belonged, then you know, a certain history of, uh, of Western esoteric ideas, Western esoteric movements, you realize that, in fact, this, this synthesis was not necessarily new. I mentioned Eliphas Levy and, and uh, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. I mean, you, you find this idea there as well. Although with Levy, perhaps there was more of a focus on Western sources, uh, the interest uh, in... in Eastern Oriental material was not as uh, prominent as it was with Crowley later, and certainly also with, uh, with Blavatsky. With Blavatsky and generally with the Theosophical movement, you do have very clearly, very visibly, an interest in, uh, in Eastern traditions and also an attempt at creating a synthesis. With Crowley, you, you have that, so he, he does that, but also I think he uh, does something else that is that is interesting because he connects this um uh, this eclecticism and this attempt at synthesizing all these different traditions also with a very strong emphasis on uh, the practical aspect so on, on practice on spiritual practice so this is something that for instance you don't find so evident in eliphas levy so Eliphas Levy uh, writes uh, this famous classic of occultism, Dogma et Rituel de la Haute Magie, uh, so dogma and ritual uh, of high magic. But then, you know, there is the ritual, but the practice is not so evident. And then Eliphas Levy himself says, well, you know, yeah, obviously uh, magic is also about practice, but I, I haven't done 
myself so much of it. And, uh, you know, when I, when I did it, yeah, maybe I was not so impressed after all. So that's, that's a little bit the message that you get. <laughs> and also with the Theosophical Society, yeah, I mean, there is a huge amount of theory, uh, the, you know, the, lots of ideas, fantastic, you know, amazing ideas. But then with respect to practice, you can see that there is always a bit of a tension there. And this is also the reason why uh, at some point some uh, occultists who belong to, to that period, so we are talking about the late 19th century, who were reading about all these fantastic esoteric ideas at some point wanted more. And this is how you can explain the emergence of uh, new occultist organizations, such as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, the Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, uh, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. These are all examples of organizations that were created precisely because people wanted more. You know, they also wanted to practice. But, you know, if you take uh, the, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the Golden Dawn, there, you know, you did have the emphasis on, on practice, of course. And this is where Alistair Crowley himself, you know, has his first training into the practical side of, uh, of occultism. But then at the same time, you know, there was more of, uh, you know, a focus on, on Western material. Uh, uh, this was also part of another tension, you know, between the Theosophical Society and the Golden Dawn, one, you know, leaning more towards uh, Eastern material and the Golden Dawn leaning more towards Western material. And, and there comes Crowley and he brings everything together. So you have Western stuff, you have Eastern stuff, you have theory, but you also have practice. Um, and then something else that I think is very important, at least rhetorically with Crowley, is the idea that um, uh, magic should not be something for the elite. It should not be something for the intellectual elite. It should not be something for a kind of initiatory elite, but it should be something for everybody. If you read the introduction to um, to magic, magic in theory and practice, which is supposed to be Crowley's own classic on uh, on magic, well, it's it's very clear. Uh, as I said, at least from a rhetorical point of view, what Crowley is saying there is that magic should be for everybody. Magic is for all. Right? This is what he writes. Uh, you know, it is for the house housewife. It is for the working class. It's not just for people who have uh, the leisure. Uh, you know, or or the means to have acquired a certain education. So this is, in a certain sense, this I would say is revolutionary. He democratized magic. <laughs> yes, that's the idea. That's the idea. So you can uh, you can call it a form of popularization of magic, but you can also, you know, understand it as a sort of democratization uh, of magic. So this is an idea that is going to be extremely popular, extremely successful, and it, you know it's going to have um, echoes up uh, until the the new age and up to uh, to our days, basically. So it's an idea that you find back also in later occultists uh, who were very familiar also with Crowley's ideas, such as uh, Israel Regardi, for instance, Dion Fortune. So in this respect, they are more or less, you know, with some nuances. They are more or less following uh, on on that path. So the idea that in fact there should be a sort of opening up uh, of what has been considered uh, for too long as uh, you know something that should be kept secret, uh, should be kept esoteric. So uh, just for a small elite uh, of of persons. So. The important thing, however, because this also has to be nuanced a bit, the important thing is that, you know, there is the rhetoric, of course, that you find there, but this doesn't mean that uh, Crowley himself is necessarily consistent with that. And so, uh, in fact, magic also for Crowley remains something for, for an elite, because there is something that I think belongs to the logic of initiation itself. You know, I, I don't think, you know, you can uh, escape from the fact that if you are initiated into something, you become separated from those who are not initiated. 
And of course, initiation is a concept that is very important for Crowley himself. It's important for, in fact, for, for most esotericists, starting at least from uh, the 18th century. But, uh, you know, and, and, you know, especially in the context of Freemasonry. But, um, you know, it is also there with Crowley. And this means that uh, you, you may talk as much as you want about magic being for everybody, being for all. But at the end of the day, the persons who are able to get to a certain stage, to a certain level of, uh, of spiritual evolution are a minority of people. You know, persons who are actually capable of reaching these higher states uh, of uh, of magical and spiritual evolution, you know, they are not all. They, they are just a small, uh, a small group of persons. These few people who are actually able to reach that uh, that level um, are is it um, due to their natural inclinations or is it? because of the practices that they do and they learn and they put into practice? That's really a tough question, actually. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. In the case of Crowley, uh, yeah, I'm not so sure, actually. It could be a little bit of both. Uh, it, could be, um, it could be natural inclination. It could be, uh, you know, a talent or a gift that you have, um, you know, since you were born. So it's it's uh, part of you. But then certainly it also has to do a lot uh, with uh, with training, you know, with hard work. Um, so, I mean, you, you have different uh, schools of thought there, different traditions. If you take someone like uh, Edward Buller Lytton, uh, the famous uh, novel writer and politician, uh, who wrote the famous novel Zanoni, published in the 1830s, which was, you know, immensely influential to, to, to later occultism. The influence of Edward Buller Lytton in this respect is as big, at least in the context of, uh, of British occultism, as the influence of Eliphas Levy. So you find it back in, uh, in the Theosophical Society, you find it back uh, in, in, in Crowley and in, in many other occultists. So if you take Edward Buller Lytton, he said uh, a magician uh, is born a magician. So, you know, you, you don't become a magician. You, you are born a magician. So you, in, in that case, you know, you can practice as much as you want. But if you don't have that particular quid, you know, that, that you have from the beginning, then you will never get there. I think with Crowley, it's probably a little bit of both. Um, and um, it's clear that practice has immense uh, importance. And you can, you can see it not only theoretically uh, within, but also in the biography, in his own biography, because you, you, you can see that basically he was following, you know, his own particular initiatory uh, trajectory, which was based basically on the model of, uh, of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, on the initiatory structure of the Golden Dawn. And this was based on a particular, uh, you know, a kind of curriculum, a practical curriculum that he devised himself for himself and which he then uh, presented also to his, own, to his own followers, to the practitioners that were coming to him and becoming members of the groups of which of the organizations of which he was the leader. So um, from the diaries that he has left, you can see that actually he was practicing a lot. He was you know, going through uh, in very intense periods of practice. And for him, subjectively, uh, the, 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 the moment in which he would be able to move on to the next stage of initiation was justified by the amount of practice, of spiritual practice that he had gone through. So, um, so yeah, that's 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 what I you know I would add. But if you if you move a little bit uh, forward, a little bit, and you, you take another figure like uh, Israel Regardi, for instance. For Israel Regardi, things are are much clearer. I think for for Regardi. You know, it's not so much a matter of personal uh, talent or gift. You know, uh, anybody can acquire these things. You, you know, practice is 
what you need. You, you, you need sound theory, you need sound, uh, sound uh, practice, and you're going to get there. So I think this process of democratization, uh, the seeds of which you find in Crowley, is brought even a step further with people like, uh, like Rigardi. And then it comes to, you know, uh, to, to, to kind of uh, full uh, blooming, so to speak, uh, even later, starting from uh, uh, the 1960s with um, uh, the human potential movement uh, with the New Age and so yeah, on. And even with, with the chaos magic. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, even later with 1970s uh, with chaos magic, this kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So if you do certain things, uh, certain things will follow. So the basic idea is already with Crowley. But then you can see that um, the problem with Crowley is that it's not just about magic. It's also about a particular religion in which he has a particular role. And this role, you, you, you know, you realize is not coming just from practice. It's not coming just from uh, training, so to speak. It's coming because there is a call, because there is a vocation. There is an invocation and then there is a vocation in the sense that um, it, it, it is not just Crowley practicing something and then becoming a great magician. It's also about the gods who have, you know, a fantastic cosmic mission for Crowley and they call him. So they, they invite him to fulfill this particular cosmic role. And, you know, obviously I'm talking about... Uh, uh, the 1904 revelation of the Book of the Law, which takes place uh, in Cairo, in Egypt, and which is uh, the turning point of Crowley's spiritual career. So uh, this is the moment when uh, he, he receives this, this text, this book, uh, on which his uh, religion, Thelema, is, uh, is based. So... There is no way in which you, you can get there just with the practice of magic. There is another level there. There is, there is something else. And I don't know, you, you could uh, see perhaps a bit of a tension between the, between the magical side of things and, and this religious side of things. Crowley is always trying to bring the two together. So to find the synthesis also there, not just between different traditions, you know, Eastern traditions, Western traditions, practice theory, but also there between the magical side of his, um, you know, of his work and, and the more religious side of, it, uh, of his work. And eventually, if you want to talk about his legacy, you, you, you have to consider both. You have to take both into account. Today, there are people who are more interested in one aspect, perhaps, not necessarily in the other, and people who are interested in the other and not necessarily in the, you know, in the, in the first one. So there are people today who may practice uh, ritual magic uh, based on, uh, on Crowley's books, you know, and may find Crowley's ideas extremely interesting. I mean, you know, they, they may go back to, to what he has to say about the practice of magic and who are not necessarily interested in Thelema. They, they don't want to become uh, Thelemite, you know. And then perhaps you also have Thelemite who, you know, really practice the Lima as a religion and maybe are not necessarily interested in, in the practice of, of ritual magic. You know, uh, the, 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 there are ways in which you can practice the Lima without necessarily going into, you know, all the practice of ritual magic. So here, you know, there are many uh, possible combinations, many, many different aspects that should be taken into account. And I was wondering, um, what are the main aspects, the core principles in, uh, in the tradition of the Lima? Well, uh, I think that uh, the first thing that should be said when we talk about the Lima is that clearly there is, uh, you know, a, a very interesting tension again between um, elements that are clearly derived from um, a biblical context. So uh, certain images, certain um, elements are clearly taken from the Bible, you know, from, from uh, uh, the Ancient Testament, uh, the New Testament, uh, and so on. Uh, now, 
this can be explained very easily. That's because Crowley was coming from, uh, you know, a particular family uh, that was, um, uh, that, you know, they, they, they were member of uh, a particular Christian fundamentalist sect, Plymouth Brethren. So Crowley was brought up uh, in that particular context and uh, his mind was actually uh, filled with all sorts of uh, ideas, images taken from um, from the Bible, and these things you find back actually in Philema. Uh, so the, the great beast, which is the name that, that uh, Crowley uh, takes at one point, which, which is part also of uh, his uh, his role of his cosmic uh, mission, uh, is obviously taken from uh, the Book of Revelation, from from the Apocalypse of Saint John. And so is also uh, the Scarlet Woman, uh, Babylon. These are all, you know, all, all aspects of the Lima that go back to this kind of tradition. Even if the revelation of the Lima, uh, as it takes place uh, in Egypt in 1904, uh, ostensibly is coming from Egyptian gods, so from a totally different uh, religious tradition. You see, so. Uh, uh, I think there there is there is something interesting. There again, you you, you find an attempt at some kind of um, synthesis or, or syncretism. At the end of the day, what is important is that certainly in Crowley there was a very strong anti-Christian element. Uh, so personally, uh, because of his own experience of a certain form of Christianity, so the very rigid Christianity of his parents. And then also the, the Christianity that, that he encountered also later uh, in school at the time, we we're talking about the late Victorian period, of course. So, you know, with, uh, with um, uh, a very strong influence of evangelicalism. So that experience brought him to develop a kind of, um, let's say, rebellious attitude. So, so he clearly developed a very, very hostile attitude towards uh, towards Christianity. So that, that's something very, uh, very important. And you find it also in, in Thelema itself. So Thelema is supposed to be a religion that supersedes Christianity. So Christianity, together with other religions that um, uh, arose in the last uh, 2,000 years, so uh, you, know, you, you may include uh, Judaism, you may include Islam, you may include also uh, Buddhism, so all these traditions, these religious traditions, belong to the past. You know, they 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 um, they are now superseded by this new revelation. So 1904 marks the beginning of a new era, of a new period, or of a new eon, as Crowley uh, calls it. So uh, Thelema is supposed to be uh, a new form of religion, and it's a religion that is symbolized by uh, a child. So Horus, the Egyptian god Horus, is presented especially in its uh, a childlike form. So Horus as a child. So whereas, you know, the older religious traditions, particularly Christianity, were supposed to be based on the idea of the father, because they were paternalistic, they were authoritarian, uh, now we have new religions based on the idea of the child. And the child is rebellious. The child doesn't listen. The, the, you know, the child does what he wants, basically. So the idea of doing what you want in this respect is, is key, is crucial in, in this sense. Anyway, we, we, we will get back to this. So Horus is uh, obviously this, this child and uh, this means that uh, the new religions that uh, will will arise now from now on will be based uh, on on this on this principle on this idea. Now, doing what you want means something <laughs> very specific in the context of Thelema, because Thelema in ancient Greek means uh, will. Uh, and in fact, one of the basic principles of Thelema is do what thou wilt shed shall be the whole of the law. So this is taken from the book of the law, the, the text that is being revealed in 1904 to Crowley. Now, what does this mean? What does this mean? So clearly Crowley uh, uh, went at 
great lengths to explain that uh, this doesn't mean do whatever you like. You know, the first things, the first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, you know, you just follow your fancy and you know and be happy. Um, no, it's something a little bit more complex. It means that you have to realize that, it, that there is something inside of you that you can call your true will. It's it's a kind of energy in a certain sense. So it's the kind of direction that your life is supposed to take. So if you if you um, want to think of a metaphor, it could be like a, a celestial body. So like a planet, you have you know, a certain trajectory, and and you are supposed to follow that trajectory. Sometimes you don't realize it. Uh, so there is tension. Uh, between you know different aspects of your personality, the awareness of what you know where your life should go is not fully present to you, and so you resist it. You resist it, and this creates all sorts of um, bad negative consequences. But if you are able to discover what your true will is, and you are able to follow your trajectory then you are, in fact, uh, you know, discovering your, your true personality and you are becoming a, through, a, a true telemite. So this has to do also with, uh, with uh, initiation. So, in fact, discovering your true will is also part of a, a, a magical and esoteric process in itself. Yes, religious, of course, because the Lima, after all, is a religion. And this is this is also how it is considered by 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 Crowley himself to a certain extent. I mean, religion is is of course a complicated term because uh, it, it's it's a word that is not, you know, that also has negative connotations today. People don't want to call themselves religion because when they think about religion, they think about traditional religion, think about you know. Uh, uh, institutional uh, religions. They think about dogmas. They think about these things, and then they say, "No, I'm not religious." Of course, you know, I'm I'm, I'm something else, and you know, maybe I'm religious, I'm spiritual, or but um, but you know, in, in a netic sense, certainly we could, we can call Lima uh, a new religion, and this is also how Crowley looked at it himself. Although he he may have said different things in different places, but obviously when he was comparing the Lima. To other uh, religions that came before Thelema, such as Christianity or Islam or Buddhism, clearly he is drawing this this parallel himself. So to, to that extent, Thelema is also uh, a religion. So yes, it is a religious uh, a religious um, path. It is a spiritual path. It is a an initiatory and and um, magical path, and it is about becoming a fully realized uh, human being, a fully enlightened uh, human being. So discovering your true will is something uh, similar to what you find in other uh, religious traditions, such as Buddhism. So basically, you know, when you discover your true will, it's something, it's not exactly the same after all, because for Crowley, certainly Thilema is, is even better than Buddhism, but you know, it, it, it's something that goes in a similar direction. It's certainly about stripping uh, the, il, uh, you know, the illusion away from your eyes, things that don't count, that are just, um, you know, uh, not part of, of real reality, and then focusing on what's real. And what's real is, of course, uh, will, the real will, the true will. Then... Um, uh, there is also some uh, importance given to love, uh, which is understood, you know, in in a, in a complex sense. Because another important uh, principle of uh, Thelema is um, love is the law, uh, love and the will. So that's the second important uh, principle of Thelema, also taken from uh, the Book of the Law. And and this can be understood um, uh, in different ways. You know, uh, Crowley sort of explained what he meant by that, uh, sometimes clearly, sometimes less so. And then today you also have Thelemites, of course, who, who, who try to interpret uh, these principles and give their own interpretation. So 
In fact, this is a living tradition today. Yeah? It, it, it doesn't die with Crowley. There, you know, there is not only Crowley's voice here, but there is also the voice of contemporary interpreters, interpreters including myself as a scholar. Of course, I am part, uh, to some extent, of, of this concert, of this conversation. But, okay, what can we say about this principle? This principle certainly means that um, love plays uh, an important uh, role in the big scheme of things. Uh, there is a polarity that is very important for Crowley between you know, a kind of masculine principle and a feminine principle. Love is what uh, brings them together. So here we are talking about a kind of very uh, macrocosmic kind of picture. But then more technically, so to speak, this has to do also with the idea of sexual magic. Uh, because in, in a certain sense, love is the law, love and the will means also that you have to be able to use love in order to uh, produce certain things. So to, let's say, in a certain sense, discipline uh, love with your will. And so this means also using sex for instance, for magical purposes. Uh, I was just about to ask you about sex magic. <laughs> well. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So go yeah. on, I'm really interested. Well, this is, this is obviously one of the subjects uh, that titillate, uh, you know, uh, the, the audience. Uh, usually when you, when, you, <laughs> when you go there, you can see, oh, okay, whoa, whoa. This is... Uh, this the, is the audience wakes up as soon as you say, Sex yeah. magic. <laughs> but uh, se sex magic obviously plays an important role in, uh, in Crowley's system. And he is one of the authors who systematize uh, sex magic. So who, who, who create a system for sex magic. And this is obviously very important in the, in the history of this new form of magic, which really it takes shape uh, around the mid 19th century with Pascal Beverly Randolph, another very important occultist, uh, an American one this time. So uh, Crowley, you know, is someone who, be, who, who, who is part of this story and certainly uh, gives a very, very important, uh, extremely important contribution to the systematization of this, uh, of this new, uh, well, this new, you know, form of magic, so to speak. Now, uh, what, what is sex magic, you know, in, in, uh, in, in a nutshell, not to go into too many details? Uh, <laughs> sex magic is obviously the use of sex, more generally of, of sexuality, for magical purposes. What are these magical purposes? Let's say that very generally there are two main categories here eh, to, to differentiate. Things are more complicated, but let's, let's make it simple. Let's make it simple. There are two large categories. On the one hand, you have uh, magic being used to obtain you know, very concrete uh, results. You know, so suppose uh, that you want to, uh, you know, you need money. You're broke. You need to do something. You, you need cash. So magic is what can be used for this. You know, many... Magicians have used this in the past. Crowley is one of them. Crowley uses magic also for, for that purpose. We, we know it from his diaries. He's, he doesn't hide it. So it's clearly there. Um, but, but, you know, there may uh, be, uh, you know, all sorts of other concrete, practical material examples. For instance, um, restoring health, typical example. Or, you know, um, uh, being able to learn something without uh, doing too much effort. So this is something that you find typically in, in uh, many magical handbooks from, uh, from a distant past. So starting from the, uh, the ancient magical papyri th uh, through the grimoires uh, of the Middle Ages up to our days, basically. So you, you have all sorts of recipes that help you to, to get there, to, to, you know, to achieve this kind of very practical, very immediate results. And then there is a second category. The second category is about spiritual enlightenment. It's about spiritual evolution. So uh, this is something a bit more impalpable, so to speak, because if you ask for money and you say, you know, I want some cash, and now <laughs> either you get it or you don't. 
So uh, clearly, you know, the, the, the proof should be uh, rather easy. When it comes to, you know, achieving spiritual enlightenment, uh, you know, achieving a certain uh, degree of, of, of spiritual evolution, things are a bit more complicated also because this, to a certain extent, is based on subjective criteria, right? Y y you are the only one who can say whether you got there or not. Uh, well, unless you, you, know, you, you have some side effects, like you, you start to glow uh, in the dark or, or this kind of stuff. But, you know, uh, normally, uh, the fact that you have received, you know, uh, an illumination, uh, an insight about, um, you know, the mysteries of the cosmos, of the universe, this kind of stuff. Well, this is something that, that you know yourself. You can, you know, you can maybe write about it, talk about it, but whether people will take it at face value, whether people will agree with you that this is really a deep uh, insight about cosmic mysteries, well, it's, it's another matter, of course. And, you know, we, we should also keep in mind that sometimes these kind of experiences are not easy to communicate, to express. Sometimes they, they are ineffable, ineffable in the sense that, you know, you, you cannot really talk about them. Okay. Yeah, th this is what mystical experiences usually are supposed to be about. So there, if you use magic for this kind of stuff, you know, it's a bit more complicated. Sex magic can be used for both. It's, it, you know, it's just the application, the use of, uh, of magic, uh, sorry, uh, of sex, in order to uh, get some of these results belonging to either category. What is the logic on which this is based what what is uh, let's say the um the ideology on which this is based this is based on the idea that uh, mm, the body uh, or let's say the human being is not just made of um, a material body but there are forces energies in the body that are subtle uh, and that may be called spiritual, okay, if you want to use uh, this term. But of course, you know, you, you may find other terms being used, but this gives an idea, I, I, I guess. So something that does not belong to the realm of matter, it cannot be um, tested, it cannot be measured, it cannot be seen even, but it can be perceived. It can be, perce it can be sensed by those who have you know, the, the, the right sensibility or the right sensitivity, the right sensitivity to, to, to pick it up, so to speak. Okay, so in principle, if you are a magician, you can do that. Now, these uh, energies, these forces are flowing through your body. They are part of your body, but they flow at a different level of reality than, than you know, the material level. Now, these energies are there and they can be uh, set into motion in a particular way, uh, they can, you know, they can be used and manipulated precisely in order to achieve those magical goals that you may have. Now, the fact is that sex is a very powerful tool to interact with these energies, you know. So uh, the fact of, um, for instance, uh, creating an inner tension that is given, you know, by uh, sexual arousal, you know, excitement, is part of setting these energies into motion. Then this may lead to climax, to orgasm, or not. There are different schools, different traditions there. Uh, some may give importance to one, some may give importance to the other, to, the, to getting very close to the climax, without really getting there. Some may say, no, in fact, you have to get there because the emission of the fluids, which has been so energized, is part of the process. And interaction with the fluids, even after they have been separated from your body, is part of the ritual, is part, you know, is part of the magical practice. So you have all sorts of you know, traditions there. Crowley belongs to the school that tends to see the emission of the so reaching the climax, reaching the orgasm, 
and therefore also the emission of the fluids from the body, both of the female body and the male body, as an important part of the ritual. And then, in his case, the mixing of these different fluids and the ingestion of the fluids, or also the use of the fluids, in, you know, in other ways, is important for the magical operation to work. Okay. Now, this, of course, has very interesting parallelisms with other traditions uh, that you find in the East, notably. Uh, like you have Tantra, you have Tao in China. So, in fact, there, have, there has been a lot of speculation about, uh, you know, possible influence of these traditions on Crowley. There is actually a growing literature now on this. Uh, you know, the, the first author that comes to mind is Gordon Djurjevic, who has written quite a bit about this. There are different opinions. I belong to the more skeptical uh, side, um, you know, of, um, of, of the scholars uh, who are interested in this. Uh, perhaps Gordon Djurjevic belongs, you know, to the side of uh, scholars who tend to think that, in fact, this influence was there and it was important. I tend to think that, um, in fact, a certain tradition of sex magic had developed uh, in Europe and in America, so let's say in the West more generally, even before, you know, the, uh, you know, an influence of Eastern ideas could really be visible, you know, could, could you know, could be seen. Uh, so coming with the translation of uh, texts belonging to the tradition of Tantra, or the, the, or even even more, more complicated to the tradition of, of Chinese Taoism. So, um, so I tend to think that, in fact, the basic idea was already there before people discovered Tantrism. See, so the idea of the emission of the fluids, the, the idea of the ingestion of the fluids. Now, of course, there is an interesting, uh, you know, uh, similarity there. So this is, of course, and at some point, of course, the influence of these traditions kicks in. At some point, it becomes clearly visible, and then it gets connected uh, to what you know, exists already as, the, you know, the Western tradition of sex magic. And then you have all sorts of um, interesting results from that, interesting interactions. But I would say that probably quite a few occultists, including Crowley himself, had already got there without necessarily that kind of, of influence. Mm. Yeah, that's really fascinating because usually people tend to think that it is due to tantrism and inspirations from the from Asia and especially from yeah Indian traditions. I think the final word has not been given on this, as as uh, sometimes people say with with the kind of legalistic term, the jury is still out. In a certain sense, the jury is always out because you know you can always make a new discovery. You can always find something new. And interesting that is modifying is going to modify the picture, so there is never really the final word. And as I said, I belong more to the kind of skeptical school uh, of interpretation of this stuff. But you know, I am open, uh, so I know that uh, you know Crowley um, lived a relatively long life, right? So clearly, he starts to use sex in a certain moment in his life, uh, so that's certainly in the 1910s, more or less, so that's when he starts really developing his, his own methods of sex magic. But then he goes on doing this until, you know, the end of his life, that's uh, in, the, in the late 40s, actually, uh, where he's not practicing so much at the end of his life, really, his, his health was not so good at the end, but still, he was certainly thinking about it, and, you know, whatever he could do, he would still, he, he would <laughs> still do. But the, the, the I don't doubt is, it. <laughs> right. The thing is that he may certainly have received uh, influences. He, he, he certainly has read stuff and he had contacts with people who, who had been influenced by these ideas. So certainly, you know, things get, get mixed up at some point. You, you, you can really tell, you know, what is coming from, from where, uh, really. It's, it's, a, it's an entangled uh, story. So it's, it's a complicated story. But it has to be said within... The, the, the even more complex uh, context 
of the history of sex magic as a whole. And as I said, I mean, it, it starts way earlier than Crowley. Crowley is not the inventor of sex magic. This, this is actually starting with Pascal Beverly Randolph, who was, you know, doing his own stuff and publishing his own stuff when Crowley was not even born. In fact, he, Randolph died uh, in the same year as Eliphas Levy, 1875. So actually Crowley could have been his reincarnation rather than <laughs> Eliphas <laughs> Levy's. The problem is that Crowley, for what we know, was not really that familiar with Pascal Beverly Randolph. There are not really references to Randolph in his own writings. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually a fascinating, a fascinating matter because, um, yeah, and also, as you said, uh, Crowley's work and uh, his interpretation of magic and even the sexual approach to magical practices are still extremely influential today for contemporary uh, magic practitioners. So clearly he was able to kind of communicate and ingrain these kind of ideas within the magical communities, even um, yeah, that survived him even. Yes, but look, you know, one of, you know, I, one of the things that I am really interested in and, and I think this is what I have been trying to do since uh, I have started doing serious work on, you know, on the material that I study, you know, modern Western esotericism generally. The thing that I'm really interested in is trying to put all this material into a broader context. So I am interested in the social dimension, in the political dimension, sometimes also the artistic dimension. You know, I, I, I really want to see these ideas, these practices, not just as belonging to, you know, uh, a kind of uh, watertight, closed uh, thing, you know, but rather something that was constantly interacting with a much, much broader uh, environment, much, much broader context. Now, for me, the, interest, the interesting thing about sex magic is not just the history of a particular practice within the history of ritual magic, uh, in the history of Western esotericism, but it's also what it has to do about the history of sexuality, for instance. You know, so it's clear that the fact that um, sex magic begins really and it becomes visible uh, as a tradition in the mid 19th century is, is significant. It's something important, interesting. Why, why didn't it happen before? Now, there are all sorts of cultural uh, reasons for that and, and uh, historical reasons for that. And I am interested in this, but I'm also interested in seeing that what these people were doing, people like Randolph, people like Crowley himself, what these people were doing was not just talking about the practice of sex in a ritual context, for uh, magical purposes. It was also something else. They were talking about sex in a way that could really sort of get out of orthodoxy. So they could experiment with uh, new discourses about sexuality that their contemporaries, you know, would not dare to, to, to do. So, and, and this, is, this is something that to me is particularly important because these shows the relevance of uh, the study of Western esotericism also for people who are not necessarily interested in Western esotericism as such. So one thing that I, I have been particularly interested in, in that context, is uh, the kind of discourse that you find in some um, sources about sex magic on female orgasm. Female orgasm. Now, who was talking about female orgasm in the 19th century? Not nobody. <laughs> nobody. No, no, I mean, almost nobody. So uh, you, you do find a discourse about the importance of female orgasm in that kind of literature. It is a clandestine literature to a certain extent. It's secret literature, esoteric literature. But the discourse is there. You can find it there. So what, I mean, sexology was, as, as a science, was, was beginning at that very moment, you know, in, in 
second half of the 19th century, late 19th century. And sometimes you, 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 you don't find uh, a discourse about female orgasm even there. You know, this is something that comes later, the importance of this, you know, the awareness of, <laughs> of the importance of this for sexuality, you know, is something that comes even later in the 20th century. But you find it back there already in the discourses of, this, um, of these occultists. Now, interestingly enough, and this is something that uh, I, find, I find funny because, you know, I have been particularly interested in Crowley. Crowley is not so interested in, the, or let's say, no, it's not even true, but he's certainly less interested in female orgasm than other uh, sex magicians, so to speak. To take Pascal Beverly Randolph, he was much more interested in female orgasm than Crowley, and he came before, you see? So it's interesting to see that sometimes there is no linearity uh, there, but it's something that goes by twists and turns. And I would say, you know, I think uh, sympathizers of Crowley perhaps will not like it, but I, I think that actually uh, Crowley was, was certainly a bit of a macho, so to speak, you know, in, uh, and, and um, certainly today, even in a Thelemite uh, context, you can see that there is a feminist uh, discourse about Crowley and about Crowley's ideas that sometimes finds it a bit difficult to negotiate you know, certain aspects of, uh, of um, Crowley's discourse about women sometimes can even be perceived as misogynist uh, and, you know, and a feminist take on Thelema or, or, or you know, uh, Crowley's uh, tradition of, uh, of magic, you see? So that's, that's something uh, quite interesting. Whereas in other contexts, also, you know, with respect to sexuality, with respect, you know, practice of sex, sex magic, you do find, you know, perhaps even a more progressive uh, discourse. And interestingly enough, this is something that uh, I find extremely important because it's not something that is um, necessarily uh, seen. It's not so visible. Women were also super important in the history of sex magic. And, you know, you uh, always see uh, a few names mentioned when you talk about sex magic. They're all men. But actually, <laughs> you can see that women also played an important role there. And this has to be, you know, still, I think... It deserves to be studied and understood better. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you so much, Marco, for uh, this interview. It was extremely fascinating, and I'm sure that my viewers will really like it. Let me know in the comments. I want to know everything about your thoughts. Thank you, Angela. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. <laughs> Thank you again. So this is it for today's video. Hope you liked it. And if you did, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, activate the notification bell so that you will never miss a new video that I upload. Let me know what you think in the comments because as you know, I always, always reply to your comments and I love engaging into conversations with you guys. Also, don't forget that I will leave in the info box all the contact details and references and information regarding Marco's works and publications. And stay tuned for all the academic fun. Bye for now. <laughs>